I'm a little spacey this morning. You ever have those days where you just didn't feel like your head screwed on right? So it's one of those days for me. But fortunately, I have some good notes, so I hope I won't go too far astray. Uh, my, my message this morning is called Hope for the Hopeless. That passage that CJ read kind of gave us a little taste of what this morning's message is about. I want to remind you where we're at. We're in Luke chapter 5. Remember, in Luke chapter 4, Yeshua, Jesus, just started his ministry. So nobody really knows who he is yet. So when we start reading about the things he does and the things he says, don't think of it from a perspective of 2,000 years later who already knows everything about Yeshua. Put yourselves in the shoes of these Galileans or the sandals. You're seeing these things for the first time. It, it's going to blow your mind. It's going to freak you out. You're not going to know how to deal with it. And that's exactly what happens here. So in chapter 4, he enters his ministry. Chapter 5, people really don't know who he is yet. And then all of a sudden we see he, um, if you remember from last week, he casts out a demon. So now people are starting to understand this man is amazing. There's something special about him. But he ministers in the Galilee area. So if he casts out a demon in Nazareth, what have they heard in Capernaum? What have they heard up in the Golan? Don't know just yet. So we're in chapter 5, and then he heals a leper. He tells the leper, don't go tell anybody. Just go to the priests and be a testimony to them. But he blabbers it about, makes it difficult for Yeshua. Now everybody's starting to hear the buzz. We're going to learn a little bit more about him now. We know he can cast out demons. We know he can heal lepers. But we're going to learn a bit more about him. Luke chapter 5, verse 18. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a bed. And they tried to carry him into the house and put him in front of Yeshua. Because of the crowd, however, they could find no way to take him in. So they carried him up on the roof. Now, th these are what I call friends, right? Typical person would just say, Charles, man, sorry. Crowded, there's, the line's too long, got to have to take you home. Not these guys. And this is, this is an example of how we're supposed to approach God. Heck, how we're supposed to approach life in general. But approach God. You know, don't be a quitter. If you've got something you want to go after, go after it. Seize upon God with a passion. When you pray for God, to God, pray with a passion. Don't let anything stop you. Pray persistently and passionately. Well, these guys don't quit. They go up on the roof, make an opening in the tiles. They tear the roof apart and let the guy down on his bed in the middle of the group. Can you imagine you're in the house, Yeshua is healing people left and right, and all of a sudden you hear something up on the roof? You look up, and there's somebody with a, you know, first century crowbar going through the roof. Like, wow, what if it was your house? Sure enough, they make a hole big enough to let the guy through. So they made a big hole in the roof. And they let the guy down. When Yeshua saw how much faith they had, he said to the man, your sins are forgiven. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees began to say to themselves, who is this man who speaks such blasphemy? God is the only one who can forgive sins. Now Yeshua knew their thoughts. And he said to them, why do you think such things? By the way, that's a whole sermon in itself. Yeshua knew their thoughts. Well, that tells us a little something about who he is right there. They're thinking something, and he tells them what they're thinking. Sometimes people think the only way to pray is out loud. God knows your thoughts. Heck, he knows what you're going to pray before you even pray it. God can't read your mind, and he can't read your heart. You, you're worshiping the wrong God. He knew their thoughts. He said, why do you think such things? Let me ask you a question. Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven? Or is it easier to say, get up, take your mattress, and go home? Well, that's an easy question. It's much easier to say your sins are forgiven, because who knows? But to say, take up your mat, then this guy's got to be healed. And everybody will know that's a lot the harder thing right there. I'll prove to you then that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. 
At once, the man got up in front of them all, took the bed he had been lying on, and went home praising God. And they were all completely amazed, full of fear. They praised God, saying, What marvelous things we have seen today. They praise God, saying, Who's they? I can't say for sure, but I think it was the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Just because Yeshua's enemies in the scripture are oftentimes the Pharisees and the teacher of the law, don't think that all the Pharisees and all the teachers of the law despised him. He had many fans and followers, even from amongst the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Now listen, these guys were right. We've got a great teacher here, a, a miracle worker, and he says to somebody, your sins are forgiven. And they got offended. That's blasphemy. You can't say that. They're right. They didn't know who Yeshua was yet. A typical guy can't say that. That is wrong. Any human being to say that is committing sin. But he's not any human being. So Yeshua, gracious as he is, he said, why do you think that? Let me prove to you that I do have the right, that I do have the authority to forgive sins. See, this is all new. Maybe they had heard about people doing miracles. Yeah, there was Elijah, there was a Moses. But nobody had ever done this before. Saying your sins are forgiven? This is all new. So I'm not all offended at the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They were doing exactly what they're supposed to do. Until he showed them the truth. Then at that point, in my opinion, they become culpable if they no longer believe. But it seems like, man... They went and praised God, saying what marvelous things are being done today. So Yeshua sets them straight. He is no ordinary man. Not only can he cast out demons, not only can he heal lepers, but he can even forgive sins. Well, now what do we do? We don't have a paradigm to put him in. We can't put him in any category. What is he? You already know but you've got 2,000 years of studies to go back on. They had nothing. They're just amazed. They don't even know what to think about this guy. He can cast out demons. He can forgive sins. Facts, talk about forgiving sins. He took it a little, little farther, a little later. Listen to what he said in John 5. This is the same time frame. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father. Wow. That all men should honor the Son just as they honor the Father? The Father in the Old Testament said I, he won't give his glory to another. Yeshua, in saying that all men should honor him like they honor God, is claiming to be divine. Now you don't have a lot of choice. You either got to Hate him as a sinner or love him as God. You don't really have any other options. As C.S. Lewis was fond of saying, he's Lord, liar, or lunatic. Anybody who claims divine honors is a liar or a lunatic or Lord. Those are the only three options. History has not called him a lunatic. He's anything but. And certainly the greatest moral teacher who has ever lived couldn't be a liar. So the only option that's left, he is the Lord. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. There have been many times throughout my walk with Yeshua, in working with Jewish people in particular, well, Steve, what about this rabbi? He's such a godly man. Certainly he loves God and he's okay with God, even if he doesn't believe in Yeshua. Well, that's not what Yeshua said. If you don't honor the Son, you don't honor the Father who sent him. So in your frame of reference, that guy is a godly man, okay with God, even if he doesn't believe in Yeshua. But in Yeshua's frame of reference, he's not okay. Nobody's okay without Yeshua. If anybody could be okay without Yeshua, we'd never need Yeshua. He wasted his time. He shouldn't have come. He died for all because all were dead, says the Scripture. I tell you the truth, he says. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. 
Did you hear what he said? If you believe in him, he says, you have eternal life. Not someday you may get it if you can live the next 50 years sin free. He doesn't say that. He says, you've already got it. Let me read it to you again. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. It's a done deal. You've already got your papers. You're already a citizen of heaven. Now you just got to live the rest of your life serving God, waiting for your inheritance. Your inheritance is done. It's a done deal. So, chapter 4, he starts his ministry. Chapter 5, people finally begin to understand this man is something special. And in chapter 5, right after the start of his ministry, he immediately begins to recruit disciples. And in chapter 5, he recruits like four of them. He only gets 12 apostles. So we have almost, you know, a third of them right here. Let me show you by reading to you exactly how he recruited Peter, James, and John. One day, as Yeshua was standing by the lake, Sea of Galilee, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon Peter, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So here's the picture. He's standing on the seashore, flocks and gobs of people pressing up against him, and he sees some boats over there, and he sees the fishermen cleaning their nets. He says, hey, can I borrow you and your boat? Yeah, why not? You know, got no fish anyway. So Peter, maybe James and John get into the boat. They push out. He says, just a little ways, far enough out so people aren't, you know, swamping him. And he teaches from the boat, a nice platform to teach from. When he had finished speaking, now how long was he speaking? I don't know. Maybe Simon was in the boat listening to his sermon for three, four hours. I don't know. Finally, he's done preaching. And he says to Simon, Let's go out to the deep water. Throw down your nets for a catch. Simon's thinking, you're a rabbi, you're awesome, but you're a carpenter. I'm a fisherman. I've been fishing all night, all morning, nothing. Yeah, it's not, it doesn't work that way. You just don't go out and throw out your nets. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night. We've caught nothing. But because you say so, I'll let down the nets. Peter. <laughs> but because you say so, I'll do it. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Those are good boats. They, they were deep hold. They could, they could float. I can imagine how much fish were in those boats to sink. You're not a fisherman. I'm not a fisherman. But I understand you're throwing a net. You're lucky if you catch anything. They fished all night, caught nothing. Had they caught a net full ever, they would have been so happy. They just kept throwing in net after net. Their nets were breaking. They filled up the boat. They couldn't catch anymore or their boat would sink. Where did all those fish come from? Were they like immediately created by God for this miracle? Maybe so. If they weren't immediately created, they were certainly immediately corralled. You know, I like to watch this show on TV. It's called Duck Dynasty. And they're famous for making duck calls. I wonder what a fish call would sound like. <laughs> How do you get all those fish there? So the fishermen who went all night without pr productivity have just gotten the biggest catch, not only in their lives, but probably in recorded history. That's probably never happened before. How happy would you be? When Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Wow, what's going on in Peter's heart now? Whatever transpired here with the sermon... The time in the boat with Yeshua, his obedience to Yeshua in letting down the nets, and the blessing he received by the greatest catch in human history, probably, in that lake. He was a new man. He had a transformation moment, and he realized that he was in the presence of the divine, and just being in his presence wasn't good. Go away from me, Lord. I'm 
sinful man. I'm undeserving. I don't deserve what you're doing for me, with me, by me. Remember the title of the sermon, Hope for the Hopeless. For he, he said this because he and his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. Then Yeshua said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Now, listen. There's a couple of things going on here. First of all, he just offered Peter a ministry. Not a job, because no income but an opportunity, instead of catching fish, catching men, ministering to men. The greatest rabbi just took him on as a disciple. Huge honor. But what did Peter have to give up for it? He just had the most successful moment in business history. He could have said, I'm with you, Lord, in about two or three months after I sell all these fish and make a fortune. After I help my family skin, gut, and smoke them. I said, you know what? There's the boat. There's the fish. Here's the nets. Tell my dad all the fish are here. I'm out of here. And I'm just filling that part in. I don't know how he disposed of the fish. Maybe he brought them home first. I don't know. He just forsook his fortune. Peter, James, and John just picked up their backpacks and left. Do you remember that little story in the Bible about the guy who's known as the rich young ruler. Yeshua made him pretty much a similar offer. And his answer was to leave. Because he was wealthy and didn't want to give it up. To him, money was more important than God's kingdom. To Peter, James, and John, God's kingdom was more important than money. Yeshua invested hours in these men before he won them over. Took hours, perhaps, of sermons, some time in a boat, a huge catch, and an offer of ministry. But in this chapter, he calls somebody else, and it appears to be a lot easier to get this one. The man's name is Levi. He's also known as Matthew. Luke 5, 27. After this, Yeshua went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at the tax booth. Follow me, Yeshua said to him. Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Whoa! Whoa, who does that? A passionate man of God does that. Who else? He's a tax collector. He's wealthy. He's sitting at his job with a case of coins in front of him. He just left it. <laughs> followed Yeshua. Who does that? Steve, you already said a godly man does that. Yeah, I know, but this isn't a godly man. This is Levi. Well, how do you know he's not a godly man? Did you hear what I just said? He's a tax collector. Back in those days, unlike today... <laughs> wait a minute, I wasn't being sarcastic. You can be a godly IRS agent, but you couldn't be an, a godly tax agent back in those days. It was virtually impossible so why was it so easy for Levi to follow Yeshua? Maybe he knew a good thing when he saw it. He was a businessman. Maybe he was waiting for redemption. Who knows what had been going on in his soul? Maybe he'd heard a few sermons. Maybe he heard about Yeshua. Maybe he'd followed and watched him. Maybe he'd been praying to God, give me a fresh start. I don't want to be a tax collector anymore. This job is horrible, but what else am I going to do? It's the way I make a living. And remember, it's a great honor to follow a rabbi. We don't know about those honors in this culture. The only thing I could equate it to is if the president came to your door personally and said, I need a new ambassador to Israel, and I'd like it to be you. That's the kind of honor that was being heaped on this guy. But you see, Peter, James, and John, they were just fishermen. Yeah, that's a, that's a step up. Levi worked for Herod. Maybe that's a lateral transfer. <laughs> he worked for Herod, which is part of the reason he was such a bad guy. You don't want to work for Herod. Let me tell you about tax collectors in that culture. They were despised. They were considered amongst the lowliest class of people. 
You had your prostitutes, your drunkards, thieves, and tax collectors all in the same category. I can't, again, it's our culture is, is so bizarre, we don't understand honor and we don't understand shame. Yeshua was offering the greatest honor to the man of the most shame. It's an amazing thing. They were so despised that if you were a tax collector, you could not give testimony in a court of law. Oh, you're a tax collector. Your testimony is worthless. You can't even testify. If you went to the synagogue with a bag of gold as an offering, they wouldn't take it. You couldn't even donate it at the temple. They'd pull it out of the treasury and give it back to you. I'm talking lowly here, people. A despised class of people that even their gold wasn't accepted by religious people. And then I told you he worked for Herod. Probably knew him personally. Can't say for sure, but he was definitely in his employ. Herod Antipas. Okay, here's how the Herod things works. I've been doing this for over 20 years, and I finally understand it. I understand like five Herods out of all of them because the genealogy is so mixed up. That's what happens when you go to a Herod picnic. <laughs> you don't know who your husbands, nephews, nieces, or uncles are. And they all might be the same. So you got Herod the Great. He was the great builder. He was the one that refinished the temple, or at least started it. He was an amazing man, an evil man, but an amazing man. He died right around the time Yeshua was born. So he's the one that had all those babies killed. But he was a very famous man. He did a lot of amazing things uh, with building and with um, architecture and with uh, politics. He had several sons. Let's just say ten. Had a couple of them killed. Had some of his wives killed because he thought they were out to get his throne. And they might have been. History has seen him as a paranoid father. He might have been. He might not have been. You know, these people were all evil and crazy. So while he's getting close to dying, he's got to figure out who's going to get his kingdom because he was appointed by Caesar, king of Israel. So who's, which of his sons is going to get his kingdom? He kept passing the baton back and forth to different Herod juniors. Finally, Archelaus became Herod of the vast portion of the country. Archelaus is mentioned in the Bible, and I actually have a coin minted under Archelaus in my office. Maybe someday I'll show it to you. I want to collect other coins from the others. So he had the vast majority of the country. Up north, so he's also Herod. Herod's son is Herod. They're all Herods. So Herod's Archelaus gets the vast swath of the country. Up north in the Golan and in Syria, Herod Philip gets that part of the country. And he did quite well. He ruled for like 50 years. I mean, he did quite well up there. And then in the Galilee, and then down by Perea by the Dead Sea, one more brother, Herod um, um, Antipas. He had that area. So in the Bible, when it says Herod, you got to ask yourself, which one? And they weren't all the same. Philip was considered a pretty benevolent, decent Herod. One of the Agrippas, which was a grandson, he was a pretty decent, benevolent Herod until he started killing people. But which Herod is which? You remember it says in the Gospels that Yeshua's family fled to Egypt and then they came home, but then when they heard that Archelaus was reigning in the place of his father, they went to Galilee? Because Archelaus had the center part and he was evil. Galilee wasn't so bad. So they went to Galilee, supposedly. That's the context that, as I understand it. Herod Antipas divorced his wife so he could marry his brother's wife, Herodias. His brother Philip. Remember Philip up north? The one I was telling you about did ruled for about 50 years. By the way, she was also his niece. So he stole his brother's wife, who was his niece, and married her. It's all twisted and jacked up on so many different levels. By the way, the woman he divorced so he could marry his niece wife was the queen of a neighboring nation that was not subject to Rome. Probably why he married him, married her, to make nicey nice with a new kingdom. So if that was the reason for marrying her, what do you think happened after he threw her under the bus for a younger, prettier wife? This is the Herod that's most mentioned in the Gospels. 
And this is the Herod that conspired and murdered John the Baptist. And this is the Herod that turned Yeshua over to Pilate for execution. See, after Archelaus died, remember he had the big chunk? None of the Herods got his kingdom. Rome administered it. So Philip stayed up north, and then over to the east and to the south, Antipas, but Archelaus' kingdom was given to Rome. And that's why when Yeshua was in Jerusalem, that was in the heart of Roman-controlled territory. But it was a religious matter, and since Herod's in town, might as well make buddy-buddy with him, says Pilate, and send Yeshua to him. Him and Pilate became buddies that day over the betrayal and execution of Yeshua. Bizarre friendship. Now, I've told you in the past, you know how much I love history and archaeology and how unique the Bible is because it's the only true religion in the world. And it's constantly backed up by other histories from other nations and archaeology. This would be another case in point. Rather than me telling you, let me just read to you from Roman history. Josephus wrote this. This is what he wrote. About this time, Eretus, the king of Arabia, Petrus, and Herod had a quarrel. Herod the Tetrarch had married the daughter of Eretus and had lived with her a great while. But when he was once at Rome, he lodged with Herod, who was his brother, but not by the same mother. However, he fell in love with Herodias, this last Herod's wife, who was the daughter of Aristobulus, their brother, and the sister of Agrippa the Great. So Eretus made this the first occasion of his enmity between him and Herod. So they raised armies on both sides and prepared for war. And when they had joined battle, all Herod's army was destroyed. Now some of the Jews thought that the destruction of Herod's army came from God, and that very justly, as a punishment of what he did against John, that was called the Baptist. For Herod slew him, who was a good man, and commanded the Jews, this is John, commanded the Jews to exercise virtue, both as righteousness towards one another and piety towards God, and so come to baptism. Accordingly, John was sent a prisoner to Macarius, the castle, and there was put to death. Now the Jews had an opinion that the destruction of this army was sent as punishment upon Herod and a mark of God's displeasure on him. You know, the things in the Bible are talked about other places. And here, Josephus, who was a historian for Rome, who also happened to be Jewish, wrote about this battle with Eretus, and it was totally, Herod was destroyed. His army was destroyed. And the Jewish people thought it's because he had John killed. The Bible tells us how popular John was and how awesome John was. So does Roman history, at least from Josephus. He was so popular that the destruction of Herod's army was credited to the abuse and the murder of John the Baptist. And who works for this wonderful man of God, Herod? Levi. Levi is in his employ. And Yeshua comes up to him one day and says, follow me. And he does. Just like that. Why do you suppose Yeshua wanted him? He could have just gone over to, you know, Capernaum or some other nice little neighborhood and maybe to Sepphoris, to Pori, and pick some religious Jews who really love God to follow him. A few fishermen and a tax collector? Kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel there, aren't you, Yeshua? With Yeshua, it's not who you are. It's who you choose to become. It's not your past that matters. It's your future. Now, this sounds good to us. This gives us goosebumps. We like this about Yeshua. But the religious people in his day sure didn't like it. This caused a big uproar. Think about it. He's a famous healing prophet. And he selects a tax collector as his right-hand man. One of 12. That wouldn't be do too different from... Go with president or pastor or priest. Now think of the lowest person you could think of, a drug dealer, a pimp, prostitute, as your right-hand man or woman. When my wife and I were at uh, Moody Bible Institute, 
we studied there, there was often a man on campus all blinged out. Gold change, gold rings, gold teeth. He was a player because he was a pimp. Well, he used to be a pimp. He was de-pimpified because <laughs> he found the Savior and became sanctified. But just because you're a pimp one day and a saint the next doesn't mean you're going to change your wardrobe. You know, red shiny shoes are still red shiny shoes, baby. Why give them up? And gold is gold. You got those wherewithal, might as well enjoy it. But it was more than that. He, he knew the world, and he knew the players. So he became a minister to pimps and prostitutes and drug addicts and, and drug dealers and gangsters. So why change the way he dressed? See, it wasn't who he was, it's who he became. Levi was such a man. But the scandal, oh. Verse 29, then Levi held a great banquet for Yeshua at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. Luke says others. The other gospel says other sinners. So all the pimps and prostitutes and tax collectors and gangsters and drunkards came to a huge party in honor of Yeshua. And he was godly enough to attend. Any less godly, he would have said, no, I'm not coming. There's too many bad people there. But Yeshua, Yeshua was like, yeah, I'll be there. Thank you. What an honor. And you know he preached to them. And you know they hung on every word he had to say. Because that's what it means to scrape the bottom of the barrel. When you're at the bottom, there's nowhere to go but up. You're floating at the top of the barrel. You don't need Yeshua. Listen to what he said. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, floating at the top of the barrel, I'll just throw that in, who belong to their sect, complained to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Yeshua answered them, It's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Straight up. Why do you suppose Yeshua called Levi? He just told us a few minutes later, It's not the healthy who need a doctor. It's the sick. He did not call the right, come to call the righteous. He came to call the sinners. The sinners know how to repent. Righteous don't. That's why there's more hope for sinners than for those who think they're righteous. Yeshua came to offer hope to the hopeless and help to the helpless. Nothing has changed. The messengers are different. Now instead of Levi, it's Steve. Instead of Mary, it's Deanne. Instead of Paul, it's Michael. Instead of the other Mary, it's Nancy. The names of the disciples have changed. But the message is the same. We offer hope to the hopeless in the name of Yeshua. Listen to what he said. This is one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Following Yeshua makes your burden light. Maybe you're at a place in your life right now where you could say, do I need my burden light? Maybe you've never become a follower of Yeshua and never felt the transition. I did. In fact, I used to explain to people before I even knew that passage of Scripture that when I came to Yeshua, I felt a great weight lift off of my chest. <laughs> it was kind of weird, kind of a physical manifestation of a spiritual truth because I was heavy laden with, with guilt and confusion and doubt and the sorrow that comes with a blackened soul. And when I asked Yeshua to save me, all that was gone and I felt lighter now, does that make life perfect and carefree? No. I have miserable days still. But they're a lot lighter than they would have been without Yeshua and without the hope and without the help. So wherever you are in that equation, pre-Yeshua or post-Yeshua, sometimes you need to come back to him and ask him to lighten your load.